you laugh at this. My first response was, that'll never work. <laughs> Australians don't go overseas. You know, they never have and they probably never will. But what I didn't know was, and, and this is completely dumb luck, is when we started CS Australia and we decided to go to head regardless, there was something called NCP, which, was, which launched about a year later, and OS Help really, really was the massive game changer. The shackles had come off that. It had been around for ages, but the shackles had come off. And I think that those two pieces of funding mechanism, plus, you know, a, a real appetite from the Australian government, I think Australian universities started to really understand the benefit of sending students abroad within their internationalisation strategy and all the upside for the students, for the universities, for internationalisation. So the, a lot of those components just came together. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm Rob Malicki and I'm here at Old Parliament House with Brad Dorothy, who's the founder of CIS Australia, Australia's leading third-party provider of overseas study programs for Australian university students. And we're on Ngunnawal country down in Canberra at the Learning Abroad Forum for IEAA. Brad, it's great to have you here, mate. Rob. I appreciate it, mate. It's a bit of a, you know, you're from Sydney, I'm from Queensland, and here we are in Canberra. Recording a podcast. <laughs> Speaks volumes of learning abroad, doesn't it? Doesn't really? it? <laughs> now, we've known each other for a few years, but one thing I've never asked you is, how did you end up in this industry anyway? Good question. I get asked this all the time, and, and you know, it, it's not one particular thing. It's always like a series of, you know, things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. But, but a, a series of things that just happened totally by chance. So randomly, I was working in a bank, decided to go and go to uni. I had enough of the bank. The bank opened up a branch at the University of Newcastle at exactly the same time. They sponsored a, an international student group and said, Brad, can you look after it? I had no idea what I was doing. We had fun days, game days, cultural days, things like this. And that was my very first sort of piece of the industry where I got a, a little taste of it. Had never been overseas, never studied abroad, but that was the footstep, the very first footstep. Incredible. And then what happened after that? Then that led to sort of, I, I got involved in a few different student groups, the Hunter Committee for Overseas Students. I got a cultural scholarship from the university. All this sort of just flowed. There was no sort of strategy behind it at all. Then I finished university and I thought, I've never been on a plane overseas. Went to America, Mexico, Canada, and toured all across that with my mates and had the best time. Like, so much fun. It was just, you know, when you, you got no commitments, I had no loan, no housing loan, wasn't married, no kids, all that sort of stuff. And I just, we just had so much fun. Do you have a moment from that trip? What's the first moment that comes to your mind when you think of that trip? I think it was just landing in LA. And, and I just expected, I don't know actually what I expected, but I thought it would just be so similar. But it was like landing on the moon for me. You know, I, I really, from a small, I, I came from a small country town called Warhope, Port Macquarie area. And, and landing in LA, it literally blew my mind. It really did. And, and we travelled right across the country, the four of us, four mates from uni. You can imagine how much fun we had, you know. And I, from that moment on, I was hooked. I was travel, all I wanted to do, when I, from the moment I got back to Australia after that four months, all I wanted to do was go back. It's all I wanted to do, and that hasn't changed since. And so then, how did you manage to go back? Because you ended up spending quite a few years in the States, didn't you? I did, yeah. Came back, again, fell into a job at the University of Newcastle International Office, looking after, not looking after, but I was a coordinator, study abroad and exchange, did a bit of student support, that sort of thing. And then a job came up in Colorado with a company at the time called Australine. Oh, okay, Australine, cool, yep. Yeah, and so I put my hand up, got the job, landed in Denver, and, and that's all I wanted to do was just be back in the States, you know, or, or overseas. And I, uh, I was there about two and a half years, I think, and I just loved it. I really enjoyed it. I, I went to every state in America, most of them multiple times. I visited hundreds of American universities, got to know some great people, really, really good people, and... Yeah, never regretted a second of it. So are we talking like late 90s, early 2000s? Is it kind of around that time period? Yeah, mid to late 90s. Mid to late 90s. Yeah. Some people, like I remember, as I started at Macquarie Uni early 2000s. Yep. And it was almost like the golden 
age of study abroad. I've heard people describe it as like the golden age of study abroad. Right, that period where like Australia was just kind of hitting the hitting the map all over the place. Yes. And then the Olympics happened. Yes. And everything went nuts. Yes. <laughs> did yeah. you guys feel that too? Yeah, I, I did f- feel that a lot. I, I sort of felt like I wasn't in the first wave of sort of Australian recruiters that went abroad to really break those boundaries down in sort of the, the early 90s. I was almost the second wave. But I really benefited from um, guys like Tony Adams, John Stevens, you know, all these guys that had been around, uh, Stephen Connolly, John Maloney's, all these guys, industry people that had been around for many, many years. And I, huge benefit from that. And, uh, you know, then the Olympics came along, spurred all that interest in Australia and many other things. And so I just sort of went with that wave and rode it for many years in, in that recruitment space for probably... Oh, best part of 10, 15, maybe 20 years. So what then led you from from there to ending up founding your own organisation or co-founding your own organisation to do study abroad here in Australia? Yeah, and, and being crazy enough to do that, right? <laughs> As you would know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a kind of crazy move. <laughs> it is, it is. For, for those out there who are thinking about it, be careful. <laughs> but in all seriousness, no, I, well... So after the States, I, I came back, I worked at Bond, you know, I worked at Griffith with Navitas and Navitas was wonderful, really enjoyed that sort of, I think it was about nine years all up. And, but after that, I, I just found that I was sort of doing a lot of the same. It was recruitment and I'd done recruitment for many years. So took a year off with the encouragement of my wife who just gave me that backing and said, look, you know, if, if you really need a bit of time out because, you know, you might be a bit burnt out and you need something new, didn't have anything to go to, so I just took a year out. During that year of sort of doing a bit of consulting and bouncing around and with nothing in particular, you know, spending my time with the family, had two kids, Jeff Palm reached out to me from CS Abroad, who I'd known for many years, one of the, the greatest individuals I know but certainly from a a work perspective probably one of the most professional and uh, experienced individuals in in international ed as well and he sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said hey what are you doing you know here's an idea what about CIS in Australia but you'll laugh at this my first response was that'll never work (laughs) (laughs) Australians don't go overseas you know they never have and they probably never will but what I didn't know was and and this is completely dumb luck is when we started CS Australia and we decided to go to head regardless there was something called NCP which was which launched about a year later and OS help really really was the massive game changer the shackles had come off that it had been around for ages but the shackles had come off and I think that those two pieces of funding mechanism plus you know a a real appetite from the Australian government I think Australian universities started to really understand the benefit of sending students abroad within their internationalization strategy and all the upside for the students for the universities for internationalization so that a lot of those components just came together and of course what we're seeing you know well right through to 2019 was Australia now is proportionately one of the largest senders of students abroad if not the largest proportionally at about 25 percent of undergraduate student body so it's that's massive yeah definitely is massive and that's a fairly i was just sort of thinking about where to take this conversation after that because to some extent i'd love to ask about that kind of year out in fact let's start there and then we can come back maybe to the third party provider stuff but that year out what did that do for you yeah good question robert it was because it, oh, sorry sorry i'll yeah. just preface that maybe because i think a lot of people maybe think of or dream of doing that and or maybe they're feeling burnt out and they they don't dare to step over Mm. that threshold and go do it Mm. so for you like what did that do what did it feel like it felt great it felt really good to take a year off and really it was a big step for me and again I I go back to my wife Jackie she really gave me the confidence to do it I'm a pretty conservative guy generally and I wouldn't have done it without her support and she said just do it and we'll work it out because I was like, oh, what about the finances and all that stuff, you know? But I did it, and it couldn't have worked out better. I ended up playing a bit of golf, you know, ended up supporting her in her consulting business and, and just generally been around for the, for the boys and, and her and the house and all the rest of it. And it, it gave me a chance to really recharge, refresh, and, and all those things that taking a bit of time off does. And what do you know? When you do something like that and you take a bit of a bold step, you know, I got knocks on the doors and, and Jeff approached me and, and this opportunity around CS Australia started and in our 10th year this year and it's gone like that. Yeah, I bet it has. You're looking quite a bit emotional, man. It's been quite a ride, hasn't it? Well, it's been a hell of a ride and, and I think, you know, 
and I say that in, in a very positive way, it's been a hell of a ride. But I think what perhaps brings a little bit of emotion to that is the more recent past of COVID and, and the huge challenges that have come, not just for me as a, as a small business, but for most people in the industry, which had a pretty tough time in the last you know, three or four years. It's good to be back, isn't it? Oh, it's great to be back. We're here at Learning Abroad Forum. We walk into this room and it's like old friends. And it's like that all across the industry, isn't it? Like we caught up at AIEC last year and sat down and had a beer. And then just walking back into this industry where, where everybody knows your name, so to speak, just thinking yeah, of the, yeah. <laughs> what is it? It's not friends, it's cheers, 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 that's right, cheers yeah. intro. Yeah, it is. Where true. everybody knows your name and you're back in the friendships and friendships and sharing stories and stuff like that. So thinking about stories, where outside of the States have you travelled that blew your mind? So many places. I think I've had, I've sort of stopped counting a bit, but I think I'm up to just over 70 countries now. Far out. Yeah, and, and, and that's just, an, I've been so lucky, you know, really lucky to be to go to some of those amazing places. Little tiny Maldives recently, you know, stands out, you know, the Middle East for, for just something really different. But you know what I think was the thing that I keep coming back to, which is what blew me away, was I ended up with Navitas going to Russia. They were sort of looking at Russia and... And I just put my hand up. A, a guy called Tony Cullen, who some people would be aware of, many people would be aware of. He's a bit of a, an industry standout. But Tony said, oh, can you go up to Russia? And I and, uh, ended up spending three weeks travelling from the very far east of Russia right through to the European side of Moscow and several stops along the way. If anyone's ever been to the far east of Russia, Kamchatki, Novosibirsk, all these places, you know, it is mind-blowing. You know, I remember walking onto the tarmac and walking up to airplanes at some stage and looking at the tyres on some planes going, I'm not sure I should hop on this plane. You know, making that toss of a coin decision. And this is only, you know, probably 10, maybe just over 10 years ago. And and sitting at the back of the plane with a a fog of smoke with half the plane smoking on the plane. You know, the generosity of the people though. I remember being naked in a sauna with a Russian guy slapping my back with birch thinking, I'm not sure if this is PC, but I'm, I'm going with it culturally. You know, so, and I've been given tubs of caviar, you know, drinking vodka at 9 a.m. in the morning because that's what you did in Russia to, you know, connect with your, with your colleagues or your courting at the time. So, a hell of a ride, I can tell you. So funny, isn't it? The world's full of all these incredible cultural twists and turns. And yeah, I don't know how I deal with the, the, the 9 a.m. vodka, to be honest, but you've got to do it. I've heard stories that if, if you're not part of that crowd, it can be very challenging to, yeah, to break down barriers. So sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. Yes. I'm not sure I enjoyed the vodka at 9 a.m., but I did it. Um, my, mind you, at the end of that three weeks, I was so ready to come home. It was just a big trip. And you realise how big Russia is. It's I don't know, it must be two or three times the width of Australia. And to fl- to so many flights and so many cities, it was, it was good to be back home. But, you know, with all that's going on with Russia and Ukraine at the moment, it, it, I look back on that and I think the generosity of those people, it makes you think about, you know, there's a lot more going on at, at different levels there. Just coming back to the third-party provider side of things. So prior to my current work, I was running a third-party provider similar to CIS Australia, running overseas study programs. And, you know, third-party providers have a really important place in the Australian higher ed landscape I feel so if if you're going in to for example talk with an, a young learning abroad team how do you talk about the work that that you do and how that supports them yeah I think it's you know it's all about relationships and I think there's a right now particularly after COVID there's more young practitioners in the game than ever before I think at the forum last year well over 50 percent of the crowd put their hand up as first timers and that was a real eye-opener to me and that you know we've lost a lot of older campaigners in the last three or four years which is a real shame but you know it's good to have that new energy fresh eyes or that there's some real positives that come with you know young blood into the sector so I think that's a real positive thing I think a lot of our approach is is as it always has been and probably for me personally it's, it's building relationships it's helping people understand what we do, where we fit and the value we add to, to their day and to their institution and to their students as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about those, those three things, you know, what you do, the value you add and how you fit in? Yeah, I think you know, I probably undermine the value of a third party, but I, I basically say to everyone, we just make it easy. We make it easy for the student and we make it pretty easy for the university as well. You know, Come along to a CS website, We've got the application, we've got all the information on the program. It's a package program. All the 
programs are packaged, you know what I mean? And so you fill out an application, you go through a process, the staff and the team and the culture that I've really worked hard to build, uh, you know, I have a great staff and, and they're what really make our organisation, that, that wonderful culture that we've got. We've only got 11 people in the Gold Coast office. It's not a thousand people, you know, it's only small, so you can control that culture pretty well. Yeah, I, I think we generally just make it really easy for the student to go through a process and, and to go abroad. You know, that's one of the things we do. Now, that's probably undermining all the hard work that goes into the systems that we put in place, into the, the training that goes into staff, into the hard work that the staff do on a daily basis, supporting those students to go abroad at every step of the way, you know, application, enrolment, pre-departure, while they're on site, the whole kit and caboodle. Generally, we just make it easy for the student. And hopefully, that flow-on effect is it makes it easy for institutions to increase their outbound mobility because they can point the students to us and they can have a fairly hands-off approach because we're, we're supporting the student through that process as, as opposed to the university which particularly more so than ever right now, they have limited resources to do so. That's definitely true. I think one of the things that I observed was, you know, it, it becomes easy for institutions to fill gaps using providers, but to do so in a way where there's, there's no risk. You know, a student will always go off and do their own independent things anyway. So those situations where you've got an agreement with a third-party provider, it's somebody that's trusted where the due diligence has been done, the risk management is taken care of, just provides that framework that gives like safety and security to you know, learning abroad staff that things are being done well. Students are having a great experience. Numbers are going up, not creating more work for an institution and, and everything's being ticked off rather than just the student kind of disappearing off into the ether, having an independent experience somewhere. Well, that's it. There's a lot that goes into it. And you mentioned the agreements, you know, the fundamental building blocks as to how we as a third party and the university work together. I think that's critical. You know, we talked about the process of getting a student abroad and, and more so than ever, you know, the spotlight really came on risk during COVID. And I think that's absolutely one of the benefits and upsides to working with, well, not just CS Australia, but any quality third party provider is the reduction of risk. Because we've got a staff person on the ground with every single program, that's that's a really big part of our risk mitigation strategy. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into a risk matrix for every program. And people don't often think or see that. There's an emergency a risk management and emergency response plan for every program. There's all sorts of things that go into making that program, dare I say it, structured and, and, and minimising that risk element for sure. Brad, it's been awesome having you on Global Horizons today. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time. And I'm looking forward to us sharing a beer this evening at the IAA Learning Abroad Network and sharing some of those other stories that maybe you wouldn't normally put on a podcast. Well... Always partial to a beer, Rob. And, and hey, thank you very much for, for you know, reaching out and uh, giving me this opportunity to, to chat. It's really, really enjoy it. And you, you, you yourself are doing a great job in this, this space as well. So thank you. Appreciate that, Brad. Today's guest has been Brad Dorahy, the co-founder of CIS Australia, Australia's leading third-party provider of independent programs for Australian students to go and study overseas. Thanks for your time, Brad. And we'll see you on the next episode of Global Horizons. Have a great day. Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.